Welcome to Abergavenny Baptist Church. Life, faith, together. So the Bible reads from Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 1 to 6 and then verse 10 to 11. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hid their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our inequities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the inequity of us all. Verse 10. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord made his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their inequities. Well, we continue in our series entitled The Big Story of the Bible, Finding Our Place in God's Story. You see, the Bible tells one big unified story that finds its climax in Jesus. And so it's a story about God and it's a true story about the whole world. And I invite you to find your place within the story. Now, we've come to the end of Act 3, which is the story of Israel, which is all about how God chose Israel, Israel, the nation Israel, to work through Israel to bring blessing to all nations, to, to restore the whole world. And so we're in scene 5, which is the promise of restoration, the rebirth of the nation. You'll remember last time we saw how the nation went off into exile in Babylon because the kings did not have a heart for God. They didn't establish the true worship of God. Rather, they let everyone worship foreign gods, idols. And the kings did not rule with wisdom and justice. They didn't bring about God's justice. Rather, they turned a blind eye, they accepted bribes, and they even exploited the vulnerable. And so despite God's patience and despite all the prophets that God sent to warn them of their coming disaster, they still refused to turn back to God. And so eventually in 587 BC, the Babylonians invaded, they destroyed the city walls, they burnt down the temple, and they led the Jews, the people of Judah, into captivity. And so all able-bodied Jews had to make a 500-mile journey all the way to Babylon, which is modern-day Iraq. And at this point, it must have felt like the end, the, the end of the story. All of God's signs of God's promises and all the signs of God's presence had been destroyed. They had been kicked out of the promised land. Jerusalem had been destroyed. The temple had been destroyed. The king had been defeated. The the, the feeling of of defeat and devastation must have been huge. Have you ever been in a season when you simply can't understand all the troubling things that are happening uh, uh, around you and you're wondering, where is God in all of us? Well, that's how they must have felt. And they must have felt like God had abandoned them, like God had not been faithful to his promises, to his promise that he would give them a land, to his promise that God would always live with them in the temple, to his promise that the line of David would continue forever. It must have felt like he was not being faithful to his promises. And so God continues to speak to his people through the prophets to explain to them why this has happened. 
And what we discover is the reason this has happened is not because God has been unfaithful to his promises, to his covenant, but rather God is being faithful to his promise and to his covenant. You see, God had said all the way back in Deuteronomy chapter 27 to 29 that if they turned their backs on him, then they would go into exile. The reason they had gone into exile is not because God is not being faithful to his promise, but because they had been unfaithful. They had turned their back on God. And so the fact that they've gone into exile actually proves that God is faithful to his promise because he said to them they would go into exile if they turned his back on him. And so this actually becomes a source of hope. If they've gone into exile because they turned their back on God, and God said that would happen, then they can trust God's word. If God said they would go into exile and that's come true, then they can also trust God's word when God said in Deuteronomy chapter 30 that a time will come when he will bring them back from exile. And so it becomes a source of hope. God will restore them. They will return from exile. And so the prophets, if you read the prophets, there's a lot of judgment, warnings of judgment. If you turn your back on God, you will go into exile. But then at the end comes these words and these promises of restoration. And so a good example of this is Isaiah chapter 40 and verses 1 to 2. It says, comfort, comfort my people, says God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Proclaim to her that her hard service has been complete, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. And so Israel is comforted because the time of exile is coming to an end. It's almost time for them to return back home. It's kind of just like when we send uh, Hannah to sit on the step because she's been naughty and she's crying. But then after a set time, we go and comfort her. We speak tenderly to her and we say, it's okay. You can come back now. And this is what God is doing with Israel. How is this going to happen? Well, actually, before we get there, it's not just God. uh, Sorry, it's not just Israel that's going to come back from exile. God, too, is coming home. God, too, is coming back. You see, we we told before Jerusalem was destroyed, the the prophet Ezekiel tells us in Ezekiel chapter 10 and, and chapter 11, that the the, the glory of God, the the presence of God had left the temple and had left Jerusalem to go to where, where nobody knows. But now God is coming back. And so in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 3, it says, A voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So a prophet yells out, a herald, God is coming back. Prepare a highway. God is coming back. And in verse 50 we read, And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. What's the glory of God? Well, the glory of God is the same glory that led the people in the wilderness after the exodus. Remember the the, the, the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire, the cloud by day and the the, uh, the pillar of fire by night. And it's the same glory that ended up coming and resting and living within the tabernacle in the wilderness. And it's the same glory that ends up coming and resting and living within Solomon's temple. And now this glory is coming back home to make his home with his people on earth. And not just Israel. It's not just the Israelites who will see this. All people are going to see the glory of God together. How is this going to happen? Well, in verse 10, it says, See, the sovereign Lord comes with power, and he rules with a mighty arm. What does this mighty arm look like? Well, we read in verse 11, He tends his flock like a shepherd. 
He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. There's this extraordinary combination of great power, great glory, God's coming back, roll out the red carpet, and great tenderness. God is like a a, a shepherd who gathers his lambs in his arms. He's the one who goes out and seeks and finds the lost sheep and brings them back to himself. Great power and great tenderness. And there's this this theme of, of great power that's infused by great tenderness runs all the way through Isaiah's prophecy. And the phrase mighty arm reminds us of the Exodus story. When we read the Exodus story, uh, we, we read time and time again how God is going to rescue his people from slavery in Egypt with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. It's going to be a great display of God's power to overcome the, the, uh, the, the Pharaoh and the Egyptians in order to free his people. And once again, There's going to be a great display of God's power to overcome the Babylonians to set his people free from captivity. And so this is kind of like a new exodus. And we see this again in Isaiah chapter 43 and and verse 16. This is what the Lord says, He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters. That's a reference to the exodus, the crossing of the Red Sea. And this is what God says. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. This is going to be a whole new exodus. It's not just going to be a repeat performance. This is going to be a whole new performance on a a much larger scale with, with far greater display of the power of God. But then immediately again, we see the tenderness of God. And we read further down in chapter 43, in verse 22 to 25, it says, Yet you have not called me, Jacob. You have not wearied yourself for me, Israel. You have not brought me a sheep for burnt offering, nor honored me with your sacrifices. But you have burdened me with your sins, and you have wearied me with your offenses. In other words, they've turned their backs on God. They have despised God. Yet despite that, we read in verse 25, God says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sin no more. Great power, great tenderness. And and, and just like in the the Exodus, where God displayed great power to overcome the dark powers, the dark spiritual powers and forces that were operating through Pharaoh and the Egyptians in order to set his people free, so again God is going to display this great power to overcome the dark forces that are holding his people captive in Babylon. But we're also going to see great tenderness. Because God needs to overcome the real problem. God needs to deal with the real problem. The real problem is not these dark powers that are holding his people captive. The real problem is not the evil out in the world. The real problem is the evil in our own heart. What we need is forgiveness. And so this new exodus... It's going to be a display of great power and great tenderness as God deals and overcomes with evil in the world and evil in our hearts simultaneously. How will this happen? Well, it's going to happen through the arm of the Lord. Remember back in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 10, it says, See, the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. Now, the the phrase, the the arm of the Lord, was a rhetorical figure of speech for God himself acting personally and powerfully. 
It was a way of saying that God is about to act in a very personal way and a very powerful way. And the arm of the Lord is continuously invoked all the way through uh, the, the prophecy of Isaiah, and it kind of comes to a crescendo in, in Isaiah chapter 53. And so we need to follow the sequence. In Isaiah chapter 48, in verse 14, it says, the ar- God's arm will be against the Babylonians. And then in Isaiah 51, in verse 9 to 10, it says, Awake, awake, arm of the Lord, clothe yourself with strength. Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made a road in the depths of the sea so the redeemed might cross over? In other words, the prophet is saying, look, you have done powerful, mighty things in the past. We want you to do it again. We want a new exodus and we want it now. And then in Isaiah 52 in verse 10, It says, the Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all nations, and all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. In other words, God's going to roll up his sleeves, and he's about to do what what is necessary. And, And when he does that, when he displays this great power, everyone will see it. And and all the nations who see it will go, Wow, that's extraordinary. We've we've never seen anything like that before. So what does it look like? What does it look like when God finally rolls up his sleeves and displays his great power and demonstrates his power against all these dark forces to set his people free from captivity and he forgives them and then he leads them back home so that all people might see his glory? What does that look like? We turn to Isaiah chapter 53 and we start reading in verse 1. It says, who has believed our message? To whom has the the arm of the Lord been revealed? Strange question to ask, but he goes on. Verse 2, he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of the dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. This is the arm of the Lord? This is the power of God being displayed? It doesn't sound very powerful. And who is this? Well, we're told in Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 13 that this is the servant of the Lord. So so the, the, the arm of the Lord, God acting personally and powerfully, is also the servant of of the Lord. But but how can the arm of the Lord God acting in a very personal way and in a very powerful way also be a human servant who suffers? It doesn't make any sense. Of course from a from Christian hindsight it, it makes perfect sense. Because we know Jesus is is 100% God. He is the arm of the Lord, but he's also 100% human. He is the suffering servant. And we're introduced to the servant in Isaiah chapter 42 and verses 1 to 4. It says, here is my servant whom I uphold, my, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him. He will bring justice to the nations. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged until he establishes justice on earth. Now this is a very clear echo back to Isaiah chapter 11, which is all about the ideal king who will rule with wisdom and justice and will bring justice on the earth and will bring peace and harmony and then will bring about a whole new creation. We continue in verse 6. It says, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the nations. And this is a clear echo back to Israel's vocation. Remember, God made a covenant with Abraham, and he promised Abraham that Abraham's descendants, the nation of Israel, 
would be a blessing to all nations. A light for the nations. And then in verse 7 on, we read, To open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon, dungeon those who sit in darkness. God promises that this mysterious servant figure will fulfill the original human vocation to be God's co-ruler. He he will fulfill the, the vocation of Israel to be a light to the nations. And he will fulfill the ideal king's role to bring about justice on earth. And he will be the arm of the Lord. He will display the great power of God. He will open the eyes of the blind and free the captives. But then very surprisingly and shockingly, in fact, we discover that he is a suffering servant. In Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 6, the servant says, I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking or spitting. Just as the nation Israel experienced a shameful exile, so the servant takes the exile experience of shame upon himself. And he, he takes on that all that the evil powers can do and he endures its shame and its ridicule, its mocking and its pain. And that's why the prophet Isaiah says in, in 53, Who could have believed this? Who could have believed that this was the arm of the Lord? Who would have believed that this was the power of God being displayed? But this is the power of God being displayed. This is how God overcomes evil. Overcomes evil in the world, but also overcomes and deals with the real problem. The evil within our heart. So that we can be forgiven and set free. As Isaiah chapter 53 says in verse 4, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our sins. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. God comes. God comes to us personally as a suffering servant. And he takes upon our sin. He deals with evil. He deals with the evil in our heart by taking upon our sin upon himself. So that we can be forgiven and set free. And because the evil has been dealt with, because sin has been dealt with, the invitation goes out. And in Isaiah 55 and verse 1, we read, Come, all who are thirsty, come to the waters. Verse 6, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let them turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon Now, of course, in one sense, this prophecy is all about how the nation Israel was led off into exile, into captivity, and how she suffered and died in exile, and then how God, through a display of his mighty arm, came to her, set her free, forgave her, and led her back into the promised land. But in a far greater way, this prophecy points to Jesus. And the voice that is calling out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, is none other than John the Baptist. And he's announcing to everyone, here comes God. Here comes the mighty arm of God. And then onto the scene steps Jesus. And he opens the eyes of the blind and he heals the sick. And he's the light of the world. And then he suffers. And he dies on a cross for our sin. He takes upon our sin, our sin upon himself. He takes evil upon himself. And he deals with it on the cross so that we can be forgiven and set free. 
And because evil has been dealt with, he sends out the invitation. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Come to Jesus and receive forgiveness and new life. And this is the big story of the Bible. A couple of questions for us to reflect on. Have you lost your way? And do you feel as though you are walking in the wilderness? Do you need to hear that tender voice of God again? Do you need to turn back to Jesus and receive forgiveness and new life from him? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we stand amazed and we do Feel like the prophet said, who can believe this message? Who could believe that this is the arm of the Lord? When we reflect upon your great power, your awesome power being displayed through Jesus, through a suffering servant who came and suffered, experienced all the consequences of our sin and shame, scorned the shamefulness of the cross on our behalf. What great love, what great power. He truly was the good shepherd who laid down his life for us. And Father, we thank you for your unchanging love, your constant love, your great compassion. Father, so many other things might be shaken and changed, and, but your great love for us remains the same. You never give up on us, and you come to us, and you comfort us, and you speak tenderly to us, and you invite us to come back to you. And Father, this, this morning we want to confess a, a fresh that so often we are like sheep and we've all gone astray and we've wandered off and done our things our own way and we've turned our backs on you and sometimes we've even despised you. Won't you forgive us? Won't you help us to hear your voice calling us and help us to respond to Jesus' invitation? We confess we are thirsty and we come to you afresh this morning to receive forgiveness afresh life afresh, new life afresh. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching. For more information, please visit our website at abergavennybaptist.co.uk.